Hey everybody, welcome to Tuesday. This is gonna be one of my crowd thinky videos where I'm gonna make some suggestions and then see what you think. I'm really curious about your responses. So this isn't, uh, I'm saying this so I think I'm right. I'm sort of unpacking things to see what you guys think. Um, if you like this sort of format, help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K. Um, because, hey, if we can do some sort of collective dialogue, awesome. Quick bit of housekeeping before I get into it. Uh, a, a few dozen of you, about 60 of you, have been waiting for my video game journalism boot camp that got derailed when I moved two years ago. Um, the, the issue with that has been a shooting location. And after the Troy Levitt thing, I'm like, screw it. Perfect is being the enemy of the good here. I'm just going to shoot it like this and do a PowerPoint presentation for it. So I'm going to start recording that uh, at the at the last couple weeks of April after I get one more project off my desk. So that is coming. I just wanted to let everybody who has been so patiently waiting for that uh, know about that. So on to the topic at hand. Um, why fandoms are so toxic and I'm not even going to say some fandoms because every and and it's not the entire fandom either right it's a portion of the fandom it's like a fandom within a fandom and every fandom's got it but some fandoms get kind of uh, consumed by it in the way that other fandoms don't and I, I looked online to see some of the explanations for it. And of course, a lot of people said, well, it's the declining role of religion. So people are using this to replace religion. That, that, di that didn't quite fit to me. I thought about that. And it's like, no, because there are plenty of people who are religious and also like crazy toxic fans. Um, and then I saw other people basically saying, oh, it's the... It's something innate to the creator themselves, you know, citing Nicki Minaj being so aggressive in a persona or Logan Paul being Logan Paul. And I'm like, that's not, no, because then there are some games like Animal Crossing that has a real toxic subset of fandom. And there is nothing about Animal Crossing that encourages aggression it's one of the most chill games out there <laughs> and you know similar to shows like you know steven universe and even rick and morty i don't quite get why rick and morty attracts such assholes people have explained it to me but sometimes it's just one of those things where something people start feeling this is ours and they get very defensive of it and there's there's no logic behind it it just is and i started to think about why and i went back to my days in in music programming where you know every time there was a boy band craze we we used to talk about the fact that, you know, the metalheads are way more chill than these 14-year-old girls who go absolutely psychotic if you, like, you know, take the piss out of their favorite boy band or their favorite boy band guy or, you know, happen to report on some bad behavior they did. They just went, they just went crazy. 14-year-old girls became the most terrifying force in the universe if you worked at a music channel and you know meanwhile we'd we'd play like metallica or slipknot those guys were you know fairly chill those fan bases it's like what's going on here and i have some theories about it part of it has to do with adolescent development and the reality is the and the reality that adolescence is a rough time and for girls feelings feel much more real than they do when you know f feelings perception equals reality to a teenage girl you don't yet have the processing capability to go i'm feeling 
one way. That may not be objectively what's going on here. Maybe I should collect a bit more information. Those are those are tools you develop later. Uh, you know, for, for teenage boys, there's this huge drop in uh, in multiple forms of empathy. And it, it's it's a development stage. There's there's no way we can unprogram humans or reprogram humans to stop that stage. So one theory is that toxic fandom comes from people who get stuck in that development stage do predominantly but other things can be reasons but trauma is a big reason when people get traumatized they often get stunted in their emotional development at the age of the trauma so if people have a horribly traumatic event happen to them at 15 or 16 years old they get stuck in that adolescent space now that could explain some of it but then there are the people who are otherwise all right people until you get them talking about the fandoms that that they you know are obsessed with and they just become lunatics it's an induced state right a perfectly rational person with everything else all of a sudden becomes irrational and that you know it looks a lot like a fight or flight response in a lot of ways and that indicates issues of identity and that's what I'm like all right now what you know drilling down on identity what have we got we've got feelings of security feelings of you know uh, uh, formed and protected slash confident sense of self man I've been doing that since I played control sorry about the aside ever since I played the game control and I I go for one of those things it's like you know control always had the interchangeable nouns uh I've been doing that now because it's like it's not quite this it's not quite that but both work so we're we're gonna do that forgive me um but yeah it's not quite a security thing it's not quite a control thing and yet it is both and here's my theory about why because back in the day people grew out of that boy band phase you know some people did some people who they're a little bit well yeah no, maybe a little bit younger than me. I'm right on the low end of Gen X as opposed to, oh, uh, what the f f do they call now? Millennials. I miss being a millennial by like two years. Um, but I, I definitely have Gen X sensibilities. And there were a lot of things that were sort of unique to Gen X. And the the apathy that that we tend to be defined but it's not really apathy it's it it comes across that way but it's more like sometimes people are going to shit on you and you can't do anything about it so shrug next because there were a lot of things going on with with um you know gen x that were different from you know the 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 boomers uh the boomers no the 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 shoot yeah i guess the the people in the 60s uh those aren't the boomers the boomers were born in the 40s um anyway you know what i mean the previous generation of us they had this big culture upheaval right they stood for something they marched you know you hear all these politicians going i marched in the 60s yeah and great you showed up to a mass gathering awesome that took what y you know you got arrested when everybody was getting arrested so it didn't matter much not like it does now um gen xers we we were getting the end of the cold war and we got the 80s recession after the 70s stagflation uh, and so on and so forth. So we were all just like, well, 
we're just gonna go live our lives. We don't have any control over any of this. And we got okay with not being in control of things. But just as I was leaving school, widespread standardized testing was coming into to most education. We don't have uh, SATs the way the U.S. does in, in Canada. It's just, it's it was just grades. Now there are these standardized tests they use, but the, they're not anywhere near as hardcore as the standardized tests in the U.S. are. And when I was in school in those adolescent years that I'm saying are, are so critical to this whole discussion, right? You could just bomb a test. You could have a bad year. You could fail, get back up, and, you know, do better. Um, we were taught that process. It seems now that people are coming into adulthood not being allowed to fail. And because they're not allowed to fail, they, you know, they don't learn how. Failure isn't something that you do and learn from. Failure is something you are and therefore must avoid. And I've, I've had discussions with young, younger people, you know, people who want to get into game design and stuff like that. And I've been very struck by the fact that it, it was it was drilled into us. So this is this is really great training for work. It was drilled into us when we were in school. If you are struggling, if there's something going on at home, if you're, you know, if there's something beyond your control that is influencing the quality of your work, if there is an issue somewhere, tell the relevant person as soon as humanly possible. People going through school now, they have the opposite instinct. It's hide it, you know, hope for the best. Hide it, try to figure it out. It creates this massive amount of stress and anxiety and freaking out. And instead of just going, look, there's this issue. Can, can we work something out? Which is how it works in like properly functioning workplaces. You want that in an employee because then you can just let them, let him, them, her do what they want. They'll tell you if there's a problem before it's a disastrous problem. But that's not the way of things anymore. Now it's hide it. And in work, it's hide it. Because unfortunately, we're getting to the point now where, you know, like 20-year-olds are being managed by 30-year-olds who have all come up in this environment of this teach to the test standardization don't fail. And I know the dot coms have this fail early, fail often thing, but let's face it, that's not the same thing. Because we see what happens in places like Google and in places like Facebook. First of all, they burn out their staff terribly, but we see what happens when you say something that the higher ups don't like. You're not disciplined, you're fired. We've seen it over and over and over and over again. You know, it was James Damore back in the day, but now it's these, um, you know, diversity and AI ethics people that are, are offending the powers that be and just getting bounced out on their asses. And that's not good. You want a corporate culture that allows people to dissent. And that energy needs to go somewhere. Energy is a froofy word, I know, but you know what I mean? Like that urge to feel heard, to feel like you have control over something, some some influence, influence over something. That's a that's a that's a, like a higher echelon human need, right? It's not a need as uh, in terms of survival, food, shelter, water, that sort of thing, right? Um but in terms of being a self-actualized person to feel fulfilled, that is essential. And I think that's where the fandom toxicity comes in, right? Because that, you know, 
adolescent development that we got of learning how to fail, learning how to deal with teachers that don't like you, learning how to deal with people who are assholes. That process didn't happen because everything's teach the test, teach the test. Because, I mean, it's crazy, right? If your school doesn't do well in tests, the teachers get punished. It's it's a insane system in the U.S. And, of course, the the conservatives up here thought that was a great idea. It just happened to be the conservatives that brought it, brought it in under Mike Harris. Thought it was a great idea to bring the same flawed system into here and give teachers less autonomy in teaching. And now we're reaping, we're, um, we're, we're, you know, reaping the results of, um, uh, schools being turned into education factories. And there are these, these skills, this sort of allowing things to just sort of slide off you that fewer and fewer people have now in my experience. So people are crapped on all day at school and they feel like they can't say anything. They're crapped on all day at work and then they can't say everything and then they go into this fandom. And this fandom is their escape and everything is wonderful and they feel validated and it feels like exactly what they want. It feels like it's for them. And some of these fandoms have been around for a while. And then somebody comes and changes it. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. I lived through the sad, sad 90s when the Star Wars prequels came out. But again, right, we were like, well, those are crap. Let's go watch the old ones, right? And we were not the nicest about the prequels. Kids loved the prequels. When I saw kids running around pretending to be Anakin Skywalker, I was temporarily terrified because all I saw was the movies. And then I found out, no, they're getting their idea of Anakin Skywalker from the Clone Wars cartoons. Okay, cool, fine. Different things land with different generations. Um, but we were just like, we're going to go back and watch the old ones, right? Y you know, they're still there. Now it's like if something is changed and not for the better, something's being taken from people. Something is being stripped away from them. And that sense of being out of control, uh, you know, returns. And so there's this cry of anguish that is mischaracterized as rage by people who it is sort of scary when, you know, it's like that cornered animal response. Uh, now, I will say that back in the day, we got a lot more new IPs, a lot more. Not everything was a remake, right? Everything's getting remade now. I mean, MacGyver and Magnum and Hawaii Five-0, oh, those were new shows. Now, everything, everything is a pre-existing IP, except like we get one or two new IPs in video games a year. And not all of them are new, new IPs. Cause like a Spider-Man game. Okay. That's a new IP for games, but it's not a new IP, but you know, we still get a, you know, a horizon zero dawn or a ghost of Tsushima or something like that, because we still have that Asian influence in, in gaming and the Jap the Japanese just pump out IP, right? Their system's totally different from ours. And so it is different because we had more to jump to when something we, we cared about was sort of not what we liked anymore. Um, there, there was not this constant hype the hype was nowhere near what it is now and we didn't have FOMO we didn't have the concept of FOMO I like, every time I said FOMO it's like Momo no FOMO um fear of missing out that was not that was not the same sort of drive back in the day and I honestly can't tell you why it would be really easy to blame the internet, but I think it's more slacker culture of, I don't, I don't care if that's going on. Those people are assholes. 
Now you're not allowed to just go, people are assholes. That's another thing I've found with, with, I, I, I became really aware of it with my niece and she'd be doing, she, she likes to travel. And so she'd be going to these places and she'd say that she found these guys they were traveling with who they didn't know because it was like this Airbnb culture. She found them creepy. And I'm like, well, why don't you get your own room? Sometimes because she couldn't afford it, but also it just wasn't done. Everything was this collective experience because you didn't want to be seen as a snob or you didn't want to be seen as, you know, something or something or something. Everything becomes this collective experience. And I see why if your your clout, if your social currency is based on being at everything, um, it can be very scary when you feel like you're not at everything. Here's a bit of a thing I learned with fandom. If you're the person who's at everything, people don't appreciate you because you're just going to be there no matter what. If you're a person who only shows up every, every so often, well, then it's a big deal when you're there. Um, and only go there when you've got a reason to go. Unless you enjoy it. If you enjoy it, fine. But just because of this FOMO thing. But all the, this is all, I don't know if you're seeing a pattern here. Instead of things being something to relax, it's an obligation. Everything is an obligation. So, you know, once things stop being fun, once something's not something you choose to do, it's something you feel obligated to do. Well, it makes a lot of sense why there's all this stress and stuff. And that's before we even get into the social status that comes with certain properties and having an encyclopedic knowledge of that fandom. You know, I, I appreciate the upset in Star Wars fandom when they wiped out the extended universe. I still get confused. Every so often I want to call Ben Solo Jason Solo because the stories are kind of similar, but no, not quite. But what was the purpose of just wiping that out, right? Um, Mara Jade not being a thing now, what? Like, this is, a, this is actually a mistake that IP holders make again and again and again. And, you know, I, I compared, um, I compared fandoms to libidinous teenagers before. Now I'm going to give a, a thing in the column because I'm just putting out evidence here, right? It's a big difference when you're adding on to something. It's different entirely when you're giving the impression, well, that old thing sucked. We're going to make it good now. You know, and it happened with Ghostbusters, and that was disastrous. It, you know, I think it was a mistake with the Star Wars brand to bring back the old cast and have the movie be about the the movies be about the new cast. It should have been about the old cast, and you gradually introduce the new characters so they can be like an Ahsoka Tano, who a lot of people didn't like at first, but then they got used to her, and now they love her. Um, it's interesting that, you know, people are so big on Ahsoka now because I remember when she was first introduced and people were like, she's annoying. She's this, she's me, right? People got used to it. Um, that's what they should have done with Star Wars. Given us Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia and Han Solo and all those other older characters and ease in the new cast instead of forcing them down everyone's throat. I think the reason that Poe Dameron caught on um, is because he was supposed to be a minor character that just worked, right? There was a little bit of magic there. And so people, it, there isn't the same resentment for Poe Dameron that there is for the other new characters because as much as I like what they were trying to do with some of the characters, they did feel really shoehorned in. Um, and that creates a problem because the people that invested in the IP 
and are the reason the IP had enough, you know, clout, had enough currency to get made into a movie because everything needs a pre-existing audience now, then they feel betrayed. And, and you're, it's toxic in the literal sense of the word. You are exposing a vulnerable group to a poison when you do that. And like I said, that doesn't explain all psychotic fandoms, but it does explain a lot of them, right? It explains the whole Snyder Cut thing because there actually was a movie that got just got trampled over and stomped on. And we see that now, um, you know, with Star Wars, with Ghostbusters, with, um, you know, even... And Harry Potter is a unique one that really tests this theory because the 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 poison in that was put in by the the creator by J.K. Rowling. Now some would say George Lucas did that as well with the prequels, and that's what got the whole ball rolling. Right? He finally stepped aside, perhaps too late. But you know they're rebuilding Star Wars now on Disney Plus. Um, and, you know, Marvel was, was tipping on that with what they were doing with, you know, all those female characters doing the action pose at the end of Infinity War, but they seem to have, they seem to have realized that was folly now. And they're, you know, they're dolling out one, one series of characters at a time and they all have their own story. I mean, the Loki series is going to be gangbusters, but, you know... Falcon and Winter Soldier, they combine them together because neither of them could probably carry their own show. But together, all right, right? They're both Captain America sidekicks. It makes sense. I thought that first episode was excellent, um, personally. I'm, I'm looking forward to more. But it's like these IP holders have finally started, except for Warner, learning how to treat these IPs with respect, and hopefully that will take the toxicity and fandoms down. Because when the IP holder, like, actively injects poison into the, the discourse around their art, that's a problem. Now, Warner Brothers hasn't seemed to have learned yet. There's all this crap coming out about various horrible things, you know, not just Ray Fisher, but the treatment of Patty Jenkins and all that stuff. Ray Fisher got done dirty. OK, there's no denying that. Can you imagine just just alone without all the other stuff, seeing what you knew the character was and then what it ended up being like that role was cut down to next to nothing compared to the original thing. He must have felt so crushed. Right. Um, but, you know, Warner's doing it again with Mortal Kombat and Space Jam crapping on what came before it's like this is their marketing mo right now of course there's going to be bad feelings when you do stuff like that and now i mean they're risking now with the rumors who knows how they're true people's pr people float these things but you know now they're thinking of resurrecting the snyder universe well you can't really do that whole hog because it creates continuity problems with aquaman and the wonder woman franchises right? Like, no, just if he does Man of Steel too, fine, right? That doesn't trample on, but no, one director should not be in control of a universe that vast. Let directors tell their own stories with reason. I, I don't think people should have absolute autonomy on those summer blockbusters. That's just not what they're for. Go make an art house film with a lot less budget if you want to do that. You know, e you know, even the budgets on things like Thor and a Captain America originally were much more modest compared to these these big these big showstoppers. So what do you guys think about this? Because I mean, Warner's doing oh Lola Bunny, and then oh we didn't put Johnny Cage in because why is a white guy a hero? Johnny Cage was never the hero. He's a comic book. Was a comic relief. He was a. a you know, hey, this was going to be a Universal Soldier game and we lost the license, so we're going to make a dorky version of Jean-Claude Van Damme. Johnny Cage was never the hero. So they're just trashing what came before for no good reason. And that's going to 
It's going to add to the toxicity, not take it away. So what do you guys think? What are the reasons for toxic fandom? And I especially am interested in people, and I understand this is kind of dicey, but I really want to know if you participated in some of that fandom toxicity, I am very interested in why, right? I, I want to know why, because people don't just do stuff. Like I said, I see people who are super awesome, chill people, except when one of these third rails get hit. And then like, and I'm really curious as to why. So I'm looking forward to your comments. This is going to be the Feedback Friday thing for this week. So looking forward to it. And of course, if you like this sort of dialogue, help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K. Thanks for watching.